take no loss. Yeah, I don't even know what it costs. Yeah, I hit the ground then it go off. Yeah, hit the ground then it go off. Yeah, yeah, run it, run it. Ooh, I really feel it's my time. Think it's my air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. Welcome back to the morning show and stock market tv spencer steve jc alfonso with you this morning we got a lot going on let's see um oh it's fed week i know the guys don't care oh steve might care a little bit i know jc does not care about the fed this week eh, fed week, i don't care that much either but it is worthy of noting uh what else do we have today got to talk a little bit nvidia maybe we'll talk some google not sure what charts the guys have. I'm sure they have some doozies, as always. Katie Stockton is the guest today. She'll be on the show at 9. We'll have Mr. Ian Cully on to talk commodities at 9.30. Good morning, chat. Dawson, Mary, James, Joe, Curtis, Kinten, uh, Chris. Who else we got there? Peter. What's doing? Yosul. What's doing? What's doing? Hope you all had a great weekend. Let's get the show on the road here. Come on. All right, what's going on, everybody? Happy Monday. Hey. I love Mondays. I was you know, just thinking the same thing. You know, on Saturday morning, it was Saturday, you know, mid-afternoon, I guess, and I was convinced that it was Sunday, and I was, like, looking for the market futures to open, and um, it was Saturday. You know, I, I like Mondays. I Weekends are great. I like Mondays. Cryptos have helped me with that. I'm just I, not one of these people that live for the weekends. Like when on Monday, it's like, oh, I can't wait till Friday. I'm not one of those people. Like I like weekdays. I like weekends. Like it's all good, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. There's, well, there's almost just as good of a chance I do something on a weekday as a weekend at this point. That's right. So, you know? uh, which is good, right? We That's by design, right, Straza? So what you're saying is you didn't go into the city for the St. Patty's Day parade? I thought you guys were going to meet on Madison Ave. No, but I did find myself in the woods. So I have like an acre and a half, like out, you know, in my backyard, a uh, lot of woods. No one's ever been back there. So it's just weeds and fallen trees everywhere. I think Spencer was back there once. So I found myself yesterday in my side by side yeah. trying to haul some wood. And I, I, I actually did a pretty decent job of it. And then I got stuck and then I, I stung myself with one of the weeds. I'm like, what am I doing here? So I text messaged one of my hillbilly friends and I was like, dude. This is my situation. I'm like a fish out of water. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I think I'm going to hurt myself. He's like, I got you. So I meet up with him last night. He's got four Dominican guys coming over to my house with chainsaws later today. Nice. And uh, they're going to have at it. 20 nice. bucks an hour. I'm like, that is, that's how to do it. See? And they're going to do a great job. And you would have been kill, Are you job. kidding me? Yeah. Yeah, me yeah, with yeah. a chainsaw. I'm going to cut my leg off. What do you mean? Chainsaw. Let's and too bad Mary's so far away. Otherwise, you could have just called Mary. Dude, there's zero That's chance true. that I am going anywhere near a chainsaw. Like, that should be yeah. against the... You should need, like, a license to, you know... They'll just sell you a chainsaw. Like, no, no, no. So, anyway, so good news. So, I'm going to have a nice, it, clean, uh, nice clean woods back there. JC's a little more at home with the block chainsaws than he is with the... With hey, the now. Hey. Hey, all right, oh. let's go. Let's talk markets. We got a lot lots going on. A lot going on. Well, speaking of the weekend, did, we had a Solana Saturday. We did have a Solana Saturday. Right? Is it going to be a Solana summer? I mean, it's looking that Wait, way. It wasn't last summer Solana summer? Uh, Not quite. Mm, July no. was good, but that's it. Yeah, Solana okay. summer was a few summers ago. Let's, let's hit it. Was let's it? go. All right. 21. All right, guys, let's do a quick little morning rundown. Dow futures up 65 points this morning. S&P futures up 38 handles at 75 basis points. NASDAQ futures up all morning, 1.2% up move this morning on the NASDAQ 100, something we definitely need to talk about. It's over 200 points on the NASDAQ futures. Uh, bond futures down again as the, as the bond market crash continues. I feel like people have forgotten that the bond market is still crashing. It's kind of just like a way of life now. Uh, uh, let's see, we're looking at gold futures, 
uh, up 20 basis points, no big deal. Silver up 50 basis points, copper flat. Uh, oil up 35 basis points, no big deal. Natural gas up 5% this morning. Dollar mix in early trading uh, with the euro up a little bit. Uh, again, down a little bit, pretty much flat. Uh, volatility index, 14.5 on the VIX. Uh, U.S. 10-year yield above 4.3%, continuing to hang in there. Very impressive um, uh, deterioration from the bond market continues. Uh, over in the old uh, funny money, uh, Bitcoin holding below 70,000, right around 68,400. Uh, you've got the Ethereum right around 3,600, down another 1% today. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Straza just mentioned the Solana above 200. Uh, that puts Solana, that puts Solana about 50, about 50, 60 points away from new all-time highs. And total crypto market cap, Mr. Spencer Israel, that's 2.5 trillion dollars in total crypto market cap. And that's your morning rundown, Straza. What stands out? We talk about, oh, Solana today. We talk about Bitcoin being on a tear the last couple of weeks. Ethereum doing the same thing. You know, we're, we've thrown in these AI cryptos here and there. This is just rotation. Just like we talk about the semiconductors this week and software last week. And, oh, big tech doesn't look as good today, but look at the biotechs or whatever, right, in the equities market. That's all that's going on here with cryptos. You have to realize there are a ton of investment options if you're a crypto junkie. You could go down the cap scale for days. Yeah, but you right, don't have to a be a junkie. There. You could just be an, a normal investor. You don't have to Fine. be a junkie. Right. Yeah, make a make a universe of the top 100. There's a lot there. But we just keep seeing rotation where some take a break, some others pick up the slack. And like JC's quoting, the total crypto market cap just keeps marching steadily higher. It's just, it's bull market stuff. And I also think if you're playing this bull market like the entire cycle, like I'm trying to, it doesn't just require you to be able to withstand large drawdowns, but also patience, right? Because, you know, earlier this year, you could have looked at the chart of Solana stuck sideways while Bitcoin and Ethereum are screaming higher. And you could have made a huge mistake to chase that relative strength and dump your Solana, right? Solana was at 100 not long ago. So it's basically doubled over the past month. So let these rotational tailwinds and rotational currents kind of play out. With Solana, a beautiful run up, multi-month consolidation, then that next leg, it happens like overnight. It's explosive. And Avalanche was mentioned in the chat. I was about to say, Avalanche up 10% today. By the way, um, before Together. we get into the, the AVAX, uh, Solana, over yeah. $90 billion, pushing $100 billion in market cap, which is going to put it almost twice the value of Coinbase. Just throwing that out there. Putting it's crazy. Um, listen, both market caps are very large at this point. I wouldn't be surprised if Solana blasts through its all-time highs more decisively and earlier than Bitcoin and Ethereum. Well, neither one have. No, I know. But so you're I mean, saying Solana, Solana could. 30% away? Yeah. That's two days? Uh, Kevin says, crypto is trash. The closest I go to for exposure is Robinhood, and that's worked out so far. So you're calling crypto trash, but you're buying Robinhood. All right. Thanks for yeah. thanks for playing. Um, so anyway, the Avalanche up 10% today. Uh, AVAX is up to, for those keeping score at home, $24 billion in market capitalization. And that puts it at um, that puts us right above the Dogecoin uh, at twenty one billion. I, and people get cranky, right? But let's just talk about the facts here. Uh, this bull market, which began middle of twenty twenty two, in our opinion, um, the best performing assets have not been stocks, right? They have been cryptos. We're talking about the absolute best performance since the bull market began. And secondly, if you say, okay, well, what are the best stocks? It's the crypto stocks. It's your Coinbase, it's your MicroStrategy. So hate crypto all you want, but those have been the best vehicles, period, of this bull market. Well, let's let's remember let's remember human nature, right? So the same people, the people who missed the crypto trade and have not made as much money as we have, and and many other people for that matter, um, they're not they're not proud of themselves. Like no. they screwed up, right? And you know they they want to poo poo. Uh, the asset class that they're not in, right? What is the definition of a bubble, right? Something that's going up that you don't own, right? <laughs> it's like taking one bad behavior and just like piling on others on top of it just because of the first bad behavior. That's right. Two bads don't make a right here. If you missed it, you missed it, right? That's, that's listen, for the record, I miss, things, I miss things all the time, like all the time. I miss things that we catch, right? You <laughs> yeah. know, like it's impossible to be in everything. So just yeah. understanding... That we're going into the market, we're looking for opportunities, knowing that we're not going to catch every single up move and every single stock and every single down move and every single stock. 
Like, that's not what we're trying to do. We're going to miss things. And I'm going to be like, oh, I'm like, I'm not in the avalanche right now. It's up 10% today. I wish I was, right? I'm not. What do you want? I own some other cryptos. I'm doing fine, but I'm not in that one. That's a bummer. You know, what are you going to do? That's life. I mean, you could always just go buy gold if you missed Bitcoin. I don't necessarily, I don't know. I think they're different. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm being sarcastic. Listen, I put the chart because I think it's an interesting timing mechanism and all of that. But let's be serious. Why don't we talk about the bond market? Let's talk about a real market. You guys want to, you guys done? You guys done there? Um, why don't we, uh, can JC elaborate on what made him change his view? What was his come to Jesus moment? Um, I've, I've always kind of been structurally bullish on, on Bitcoin, I guess, from a, like a non, non-educated non uh, investor, right? Yeah. Or more of a line go up kind of guy, right? You've been a structural crypto bull. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm in. 100%. And we didn't we didn't lose faith like everybody else in the fall of 2022. I remember talking about an epic shakeout and sentiment, you know, just being so ripe for a turnaround when everybody was quitting on this asset class. So. I mean, we've seen it. We've seen it time and time again, every uh, every cycle. Now let's talk about. So now let's put things in perspective. Uh, total crypto market cap, as we just mentioned, was two point five trillion. So now let's look at a hundred and thirty trillion dollar market. Um, some would argue a, a real market, the real market, uh, and that's the bond market, which continues to crash. Why don't you throw up slide six there, Spencer? Um, I had to. I had to explain to somebody uh, that the bond market is literally in the midst of. The biggest crash of our lifetimes and it is not over in fact bonds are down again today so um why, why don't you tell me why don't you tell me what this means to you uh you're you're pushing close to a 50 percent drawdown in the u.s treasury bond market um wh what does this mean to to someone like yourself straza young a young man you know crypto uh Crypto junkie, self-proclaimed crypto junkie, uh, plenty of exposure in the equities market, plenty, many, many, many years of investing to come for you. If we forget the Powell, we forget the inflation stories, just forget everything. Just look at charts of interest rates. We had a major structural reversal. I think the chart's in there. Uh, I'll redrop it. It's right here. But this is the way I think you have to think about the bond market if you're a long-term investor. The this is what is this 20, 20 years? What about Treasury bonds? Which ones? Is it TLT? This is the U.S. Treasury bond market. So these are thirties, uh, and this goes back four years. Primary trend is down. We just had a major structural reversal. If you want to throw up the thirty-year chart uh, to kind of illustrate that, you would have to go all the way back to what the nineteen eighties interest rates were just falling steadily, we came off the lows in a real way, right? Where it looks like that multi-decade downtrend in interest rates is reversing. So when we think about bonds now in a four-year time frame, like your chart, it's yeah, and they probably could go a lot lower. The problem is nobody's saying this or, or can even wrap their head around this because the Fed's talking about cutting. We're all we're talking about is the inflation numbers. Rates can't possibly go higher. They're going to bankrupt the US government. Can't do it, right? If you look at just the technicals, it seems to be overwhelmingly the opposite story of the narrative. And that's a nice setup a lot of times if you have the balls to get behind it. I don't know, man. People keep telling me about how like interest rates are going lower and how the stock market's up because of lower rates, but rates keep going up every day. So like, I, I don't really know what the hell they're talking about. Like, I get that people need narratives and journalists need to justify like their existence and all that. Like, I'm all for that. What lower rates? I don't understand what people are looking at. You're starting to see a slow, very slow tide change in that narrative. Are you noticing? You don't pay attention to, to the econ guys, right? The big macro guys. But it's starting to... Uh, dude, coming I'm, in Warren, I'm in Warren Buffett's camp that any company... This is Warren Buffett, not JC being a hater. Warren Buffett, very respected uh, investor. Yeah. You may have heard of him. He says that any company who employs an economist has one employee too many. Yeah. Uh, they're still talking about Bitcoin in the chat, but we're really, we're really getting people riled up here. Um, but Spencer, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Spencer knows. What called I'm it's about. called FOMO. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Steve, I know what you're talking about. Coming into this year, no one would say you get laughed at. I'm, I was laughing at uh, some of you guys in the analyst calls just a couple months ago. Uh, it is now a thing that some people are flirting with. Maybe we get another hike before a cut, right? Like 
we're kind of building that story out slowly now. Um, so this is going to be interesting. And we said it too. We said it coming into this year. The most interesting thing this year is what happens with rates. What happens? And you know what, what's really what's really fascinating about humans. Um, I mean, I just love studying human behavior. It's just it's fascinating. And um, you know, people they're interested in in what it, interest rates are doing. And people who are interested in what interest rates are doing and where interest rates are going, instead of just following what interest rates are doing, they're obsessed with the Federal Reserve. Like, I don't understand why you're so obsessed with the Federal Reserve. If you want to know what interest rates are doing, why don't you just go look at what interest rates are doing? Yeah, sure. Like, right. why do you have to, like, why do we have to put, like, the Federal Reserve, like, on this pedestal? Like, it's like this, like, you know, God thing, you know? Like, I mean, what are you, like, it's some kind of religion or some shit like that? People are crazy, man. Well, it's kind of like, that. that's the one read, right? So it's like saying, well, why, why, why worry about the earnings of a company when I can worry about the stock price of a company? It's the same logic. Oh, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought about it like that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I earnings. I don't care whether they earn money or not. I hope they don't. I mean, you know. <laughs> um But then then the other side of that is the is you know, the idea that companies get their value from the earnings they produce. And but we know uh, that that's and, we know that but we know that that's a lie. That's not true. We know that. And 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 interest rates uh in some respect are driven by policy made at the federal reserve level, but we know right? for so, a fact that stock prices are not moving based on the earnings they produce like we have the data i didn't i didn't no no no, no 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 i didn't say stock prices move i said companies derive their value from the earnings that they produce some right? of them some of them so, maybe do but we know for a fact that they don't generally speaking we know we have the data Right. It, this is this is one of like the, the, this is a dangerous thought. This is exactly what I'm talking about. How can rates possibly go down if the national debt is going up a trillion dollars every hundred days? This is the crazy shit. Right, right. right. The, the, the even know, crazier one is like, oh, it, rates can't go up because there's an election. <laughs> right. So maybe in America, you know that there's like all these other countries, right, and they have interest rates too, and they have politicians and elections. Like people think like America is like the only country. Um. Is Ian on that today? That matters. Yeah, is, Ian's on today. I would okay. Yeah. Let's talk about the futures positioning uh, in the bond market. Well, let's talk about it with Ian. Yeah, no, so, you're right. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna go um, there. No, hold on, you were talking about stocks that don't make earnings. Why don't you throw up slide six? This one from Bloomberg. Um, maybe this is what you're talking about, Straza, with like journalists kind of catching on. So this is just one of the many divergences we've been pointing to all year: deterioration under the surface and equities, just fewer stocks making new highs, Not in et cetera. It's this, is like, this is a, this is kind of just like another, you know, you can look at high beta, low volatility. I mean, there's a lot of things that that look like this, um, you know, consumer discretionaries relative, et cetera, et cetera. Here's an interesting one in blue. You're looking at um, you're looking at the what are we looking at? The Nasdaq 100 in blue, and then in the white, the one deteriorating. These are the uh, non-profitable tech stocks, yeah, uh, that are hitting the lowest levels since uh, since Thanksgiving, basically. Or so since, I would just push back a little bit. Bre breath has been improving. In the broader market, uh, this is a tech thing. This is a tech theme. You you couldn't you. There's no data to make this chart for the broader market. This is tech specific. Okay, what Wait, about consumer so, discretionary hitting new 52 week lows on a relative basis? Is that a tech thing? How many tech stocks are in the consumer discretionary sector? We're talking about breath, right? What you're is, saying it's a broader market breath improvement. What broader market breath improvement? Why are you? Why is there a denominator? We're talking about breath. Why are you? Why are you benchmarking it against an index? Relative trend doesn't tell me anything about breath. We're talking about participation and we're talking about leadership. Yeah. And we're talking about how this year is very different than last year. Very different. Um, new highs have been expanding beneath the surface all year. We talked about that, right? If you're if you're cherry picking the January 1st. I am. Right. right. So yeah. don't because it's irrelevant. More and more so when you, when you look bigger picture, listen, we're not going to get an expansion of new highs. So you can just take that out of the equation. We're not going to get it. We might not see, we might not see as many highs as we saw in December. We may never see it again. I mean, probably, we probably will, but it ain't going to be anytime soon. No, but we wouldn't want, we don't want to, we don't need to. Breath is. Right. We're not going to, we're not going to. Right. Gonna. We don't right. need to though. That's not fair is, if we don't take out that high watermark. You get that. Point, yeah, we're not going to do it uh, because we, mathematically it's impossible. If every stock is already going up, it's impossible for more of them to go up. But why are right. we even talking about that? We got the thrust. We're not going to get back to my point is, it. My point is we've been seeing deterioration in the former market leaders, the ones we had last year. And to your point, yeah, yeah, we're sure. seeing an expansion in new highs. But I would argue not general new highs. I would say we're seeing an expansion in new highs in new sectors. 
Yeah, right? materials. In sectors that we were yes. not in materials, in yeah. energy. Real Agreed. estate. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, right. So it's just a completely different market. But we were it's talking about easy. non-profitable uh, companies, which is yeah. my point here. Uh, the non-profitable uh, technology stocks just getting killed all year. Right. So, so it's almost as rate? if. Hold on. Straza, is that an interest rate thing with the bond just market? About to say that. I was just about to say that. With the, yep. with the bond market crashing all year, non-profitable tech, because non-profitable tech has to borrow money. Is that the theory? Yeah. I think, think about what we just talked about. This is the first time I've had this thought. We literally just did it back to back, right? We talked about interest rates are, are, right. are steadily cranking higher. And we talked about how this non-profitable tech has this strange situation where other things are working better and they're working worse. Those are the stocks that are most impacted by higher rates. So I That's think, right. and you know what else? Bios rolled over. Bios rolled over, couldn't get it done. Same thing. Why don't you, look, speak, speaking of weak breath, you, I mean, you said it yourself, like the index was trying to make new highs, but none of the stocks were. Why don't you look at the slide 12? I think this tells a really interesting story about exactly what we're describing here. So let me just let me just uh, set the stage. And Straz, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So, up on top, we're looking at inflation-protected treasuries, known as TIPS, relative to nominal yielding treasuries. So in other words, what the bond market is pricing in for inflation, uh, line's been going up all year uh, since mid-December. And uh, the CRB Commodities Index, uh, inflationary, obviously, uh, highest level since October. Now, Straza, number one, do you think it's a coincidence that both of these are moving together? No. Uh, we expect and want these to move together. That's normal, right? Inflation expectations rise as commodity prices rise. Uh, this is really heavy energy, but that's not to say that, you know, there's a lack of participation in the broader commodities complex. Right? This is a but great point that Strauss is making. It's a lot of energy. And it's that, a lot of energy, but that doesn't mean that the other ones aren't working. So in other words, you know, kind of like, um, you know, when you look at the U.S. dollar index, right? The U.S. dollar index is a lot of euro, but it doesn't mean that, that the dollar is only the euro. It's just that that particular index is is heavy euro. Right. In this case, it's the same thing. The CRB commodities index is heavy energy, and energy has obviously been doing well. But that doesn't that doesn't mean that the other commodities aren't doing well, right? It doesn't mean that energy is the only commodity. So it's a good point, Straza. Um, I'm sure Ian will bring along our equal weight index, and we could talk about that when he's on. However, I I think this is simple. We're talking about rates going higher. We're talking about inflation expectations ticking higher. Yeah, we would expect the CRB index to be moving higher. Energy stocks, everything's kind of coming together. I mean, I mean, I know we've been talking about it a lot, uh, whether it's the relative trends, scooping and scoring, or XLE back at the upper bounds of that range. We're talking about more risk on groups like the ENPs and the oil field services um, starting to even lead a little bit over the short term. This is all, you know, higher energy stocks, higher energy prices um, supportive, right? Uh, Spencer, why don't you throw up the uh, uh, slide 15, uh, which is a lot of the things that Strauss is talking about here. This is the performance over the last month. This is just a, a simple, literally the last month. You could take it back to early February. You're going to get the same data. Yeah. What stands out here, folks? Yeah, it's commodity stocks. That You know, that's what it's... Yeah, Energy it's and materials up almost double digits over the past month. Meanwhile, the worst performers are communications, consumer discretionary, technology, healthcare. What's really interesting is that the best performing stocks over the last month are the ones that have the least amount of representation in all your favorite indexes. The worst performing stocks are the ones that are represented the heaviest in all of those indexes. Interesting. I think it's important um, to have materials participating like this. Important. Finally. Important for what? I feel better about energy stocks in a new markup phase if things like copper and steel and industrial metals and materials more broadly are also in a markup phase right it's it's just that it's intermarket support um yeah because it's more of a commodities thing versus just a strictly energy thing like the move from copper last week made me want to own more energy stocks copper stocks too made me feel better about owning more energy yeah, you know, somebody somebody said it. I, I forget who it was. We had a guest on the show uh, last year, and we were talking about commodities, and they were like, you know, going back, we never had a commodity super cycle without gold participating, right? Um, and that kind of stuck with me. Here we are, gold's participating. We're seeing it in metals. Um, why don't we talk about, we talked about, uh, throw up slide 16. We talk about how with higher interest rates and lower bond prices, unprofitable tech is struggling, right? Unprofitable tech, that Goldman Sachs unprofitable tech index, 
Yep. Can we get there's no ETF for unprofitable tech, is there? No, there's not. Can, can, uh, we, can there, we get that list from Goldman? You got you have it? Their short basket too uh is hard to get. I tried. See, so we can't get the unprofitable tech index from Goldman. I'll try harder. Uh I'll we can get it, we'll just create our own index. The, there are I mean, you can get close, right? Yeah, you probably can't get exact. You can get pretty close. Can get, I can, can I can close. recreate that easier and faster than reaching out to somebody. We could, we could make our own. Why don't we just make? Why don't we just get a list of the largest, what the largest right. one hundred unprofitable tech companies? I could, we well, could do that in a minute. Well, Let's just right, do, I know that's what I'm saying. Okay, why don't you do that? Um, okay, so the, hold on. The, chat, the chat's all, all over it too. Arc is a good, decent proxy. But, and that's it's what a we decent use Arc proxy. For. It's a decent proxy. It's not the best. We could do better. We have, by the way, we have the technology. Like we could just do a better job. We don't have to Here's hope Kathy Wood is doing a job of buying shitty tech stocks. You know? We're gonna do it, and if it doesn't look like Arc or the IPO index, I don't want it. Right. Um, okay. So hold on. So unprofitable tech stocks obviously getting hit all year with bonds crashing or continuing their crash. Straza, would you put? Small cap Russell 2000 stocks in that same category as unprofitable companies that need to borrow a lot. Yeah. Even more so. Even more yeah. so. Just, yeah. yeah. I, so I here mean, in green, we're looking at the uh, the three month highs in the Russell 2000 or lack thereof, I should say. It's and, the lows, you know, though. It's the lows that? that are really concerning. Well, I hold on. That. Well, hold on. That, that was my point. So while we've been seeing a deterioration in the new highs list all year, and it's been very obvious to everybody. What we have not seen is an expansion in stocks making new lows. And you mathematically cannot have a market correction without the prices of stocks going down. And uh, for the first time, we're, we're seeing that, in, at least in the Russell 2000. We're not seeing it in any of the other indexes, but in the Russell 2000, uh, definitely. By the way, um, what about the profitable small caps? The profitable small caps are actually doing worse than the unprofitable small caps, right? Because the profitable small caps are the... S&P 600. 600 index, and they have to, by definition, have a track record of earnings uh, in order to be added to the S&P 600. And is, do you find it curious that the profitable small caps are worse than the unprofitable ones? I don't think you could paint this whole situation with such a broad brush, right? Because I could point to, to a bunch of speculative, growthy, techie stocks that have been killing it this year. So it's what not about the non-crypto related ones. Yeah, but even the Palantirs and the Shopify, there's there's plenty of. Do Palantir and Uber make money? Uh, Palantir does now. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'll dig into it. But some of the speculative stuff was really working, right? When the biotechs were working, biotechs is this, right? Exactly what we're talking about. Uh, and they had their moment. Sure, they've rolled over the past like week or two, but. Um, We'll take a we'll take a they look. Got going, they got going at the end of October with everything else. Yeah, but then they kept going. They got that base breakout, which the, which has come undone since. But they, they've had a they. Wait, what so what's so what you're saying? It wasn't a base breakout. It was just getting they were back to the upper really end of the race. Nice, they were having a really nice Q1. Uh, Q1. And a lot how many how many stocks are in the XBI? Uh, too many. But here's let me. Well, that's obviously, low. obviously too many. But like roughly, how many do we know? Uh, I can give you an estimate right now. Why don't we just do? Why don't we just do? Uh, why don't we just run our breath? Uh, our breath algos uh, with the biotech. Uh, hundred and twenty. There's hundred and twenty stocks in the XBI. That's what I'm seeing. My data. Good. There was there was more than in the XBI specifically. Yeah, that's more than I thought. IBB. I'm seeing fifty-seven. That makes sense because that's the that's cap weighted. Hundred and twenty stocks in the XBI. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's definitely more than I thought. All right, so then why don't we just run the breath? Uh, why don't we why don't we just add the XBI? I, we do. I, well, we do it for biotechs in general, not for XBI. You're probably gonna get the same data though, right? I like to keep it separate. Well, we'll we'll look into the non profitable tech stuff. What's the smallest yeah. stock in the XBI? Um, Hundred forty three million blue. Oh, that's all bluebird bluebird bio <laughs> i see jason jason says that i've gone to the dark side and i'm reading securities analysis by the way i've read it twice uh it's in my gym uh actually it's right next to the uh, weights it sits there and then in between sets i flip through it you know 
I'm still I, I I get down. You guys don't even know. People people yeah. try to mansplain fundamental analysis. I understand fundamental analysis. That's why I don't use it. <laughs> I understand important. it very well. Thank you very much. It's important if you're going to dismiss things and and not weigh them into your process. Things that you know a lot of other people would assume that you should. You should at least understand them and know about them and and make that decision then, right? Yeah. How else are you going to expose the biggest pain points in the market without understanding why the sheep flock? Yeah. The, the, my process has gotten, the more I've learned about all of this stuff, whether it's fundamentals or technicals, the less I do, the simpler my process is. And I can comfortably and confidently ignore things that other people are going crazy about on Twitter on a day-to-day -day basis because I understand that. Hold on. So, um, Speaking of which, we just so happen to have one of my personal favorite technicians of all time. Uh, Katie Stockton has been an inspiration to me for decades uh, at this point. Um, she's absolutely crushing with her ETF. Um, I couldn't be more happy for her, all her success. We're all rooting for you, Katie. Why don't you bring her in, uh, Spencer? Katie Stockton sure. in the house. Jay, we've Make been friends for a long time. Make the call. I mean, this is pretty professional, guys. Nice, uh, nice show you got going here. Hey, Katie. Hey, guys. How are you? Good. I, 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 I love that I'm seeing you now. We're talking about markets instead of with a glass of wine or over dinner. We are we've been seeing know. a lot of each other lately. I like. It's it. been good to get together in New York City, JC, and you guys are doing a great job. I was watching the show earlier. It's uh, awesome, and and you're making me laugh too at the same time. <laughs> what, what, so what what stood out out of curiosity? What stands out to you though in our discussion? You know, well, you guys are off the cuff, which I appreciate because I'm constantly presenting myself, and it, you know, I always have my my deck right. I, I'm very you know sort of by the books there, and I, I just appreciate how you guys are are you know all about providing your opinion. And it comes from a place that obviously resonates with me because of my discipline. Um, you know, I've been doing technical analysis for now, I guess, close to 30 years, which is kind of crazy. And we, we've known each other for a good part of that, right? Um, and yet I, I am not down on fundamental research, but I'm a big believer that it's the long-term input, right? And then the technicals are going to help you just manage risk through that trend, right? I, I do believe that the fundamentals drive these long-term trends and drive trends of outperformance and um, underperformance, but, you know, it, it's a complementary discipline, right? Totally. It's not cannibalizing it at all. Um, you know, Katie, you're talking about how like you like to be, you know, more structured and you give your presentations and you have your deck, but let's be serious. Give yourself a little credit. If you need to go a cappella, you'll be fine. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm at the point now where I don't have to prepare all that much because I have all the charts in my head as I know you do too. Um, you know, there, there's rarely ever a surprise question for me at this stage, but, um, you know, we, what we do is so visual, right? And and it's all about the chart. So it's, um, you know, part of the process for us is just looking through like a whole host of charts every single day. And that's where we're getting our biases. And it's almost like frustrating to some people um, that, you know, it's, it's that visual, there's no like actual um, formula to it. But in a way, there is a formula behind that process. We're looking for certain things. Those things aren't necessarily defined. I'm not going through the charts looking for double top formations, right? But if I see one, well, that's information, right? So we we have a lot of different uh, metrics that we're using. We're, as you know, really indicator heavy in what we're doing. So we have like a, you know, our charts are kind of busy <laughs> when, when someone who hasn't ever really um, done technical analysis themselves, they see our charts and they kind of, you know, uh, glaze over. But uh, with all of the indicators, we feel like we're able to have, um, you know, more, I guess, objectivity when we're looking at the charts. And I think that's where we both add value is in, you know, not letting people get too caught up in, um, you know, a trend and know, know when that trend ends, right? So the trend falling is something that's pretty accessible to most people now, but the hard part is, is knowing when the trend has changed. Uh, so that's what we obviously concern ourselves with to, to a pretty high degree. We're helping people manage risk. And 
Um, for the last, like I'd say, four weeks or so, we've been in this camp that the consolidation is likely. And, um, you know, I would say that we have it underway already. And so we've started to recommend the folks get partially hedged. We're not talking about anything major, no big correction. Um, we we kind of differentiate between a pullback and a correction. Um, so we're looking for consolidation to a pullback, not a pullback to a correction. So uh, we are kind of in that risk management mode as we speak. Um, but it comes from a place of, of like a very bullish stance that we've had. We've been... Um, you know, sort of hyper bullish because from a technical perspective, it's been hard not to be that. I mean, all, yeah. all the indicators have pointed higher and it's really only the, the, the short term stuff that's rolled over at this point. Yeah, no question. I mean, last year, I mean, it was it was, it was really hard to be bearish last year and, and people kept finding a way, Katie. They kept finding <laughs> a way. And that was that was part of the driver. Right. Sentiment was a tailwind through most of last year. That's mm -hmm. no longer in place. One can argue sentiment might even be somewhat of a headwind at this point. Uh, sentiment is a lot more valuable when it's overly pessimistic versus when it's overly optimistic. And in, in my experience, right, in bull markets, there's a lot of optimism. You need bulls to buy stocks to have a bull market. Like, I get that. Before we get into the, the, the current markets, Katie, you know, I know throughout most of your career, you've had a lot of conversations with a lot of portfolio managers over the years and you know, the folks hear me talk about it all the time. You know, I talk to big PMs constantly uh, and they very much value um, trend analysis because they understand that asset prices trend. Before we get into the markets, can you just quickly touch on a little bit about your experiences with portfolio managers and their interest in the technicals, in trend recognition and things like that? Well, I mean, over my career, it's definitely grown for one. Um, you know, there's definitely a trend towards more portfolio managers using technical analysis and and also using it in a systematic fashion, which we always recommend. Right. So I don't think the methodology itself is the most important thing. It's the fact that you're going back to the same tools repeatedly. That's, I think, where you can get real value in the process. So, um, yeah, PMs, we, we obviously talk to a lot of them, um, you know, in our consulting business. And we find that they love charts for individual stock positions, right? So they, they have their market views for the most part. They're obviously interested in what we're saying about the S&P 500 because we're really top down in our orientation. We feel that the market's going to drive the action in most stocks. Uh, but, you know, they have their views. They've got their macro views. Um, what we often will do is spend a half hour on the phone with them. And let's say they're a long, short equity PM, you know, trading a certain sector. So we'll spend 30 minutes and go through maybe 20, 25 different charts within their sector. So they love that kind of, um, you know, constant coverage of their individual stock positions because that's where they they get the risk management, especially if they're long short, by the way, which is a, a difficult position at times to be in when you've got a strongly trending tape either way. You have a situation in which you have to always have something that's counter trend and we can add value as technicians in that regard with, the, you know, looking at the ratios and things of that nature and looking for, OK, well, you know, degrees of bullishness. Right. This is a really bullish setup. Well, um, you know, this one's slightly less bullish. So let's see how it pairs up. So in creating pairs and things of that nature. So definitely we have a lot of buy in. But but I used to um, notice that there would be at these big asset managers usually, you know, a couple of pockets of, of teams that would really be adherent to charts and then some that just completely would ignore it. Right. So it's, it's not something that you feel like is part of like a cultural thing necessarily at these bigger firms, maybe at a hedge fund, but not at the big asset managers. And in fact, just in the same way that I feel like Wall Street has gotten away a little bit from technical analysis, like the bulge bracket firms, um, I feel like also some of the big asset managers if they're doing it, um, they're doing it in a way that's not, um, you know, they're not using it for like marketing, right? They, they still do it in a sort of a closeted manner. Um, and it is sometimes sort of team specific or portfolio manager specific. So I, I think the trend is towards it expanding, uh, but we'll see, you know, it's not something we can control. I think it's usually all it takes, JC, as you know, is, is one bad trade, right? And then they say, you know, some, let's say you call someone and you say, oh my God, Boeing, you know, it looks terrible, it's going down. 
they're like, no, it's a great company, whatever, you know, and they buy it. And then all of a sudden it goes against them. And then they remember what you had said. So right. sometimes it's as simple as that, that one um, sort of, you know, technician stepping in with a, with a timely market view will change their mind and intrigue them. The good thing about what we do, it's really accessible, right? Anybody can look at a chart and have an opinion. Um, and, you know, you don't need the CFA, um, you know, designation to be able to understand these things. Are you overweighting certain groups at all times in the fund, Katie? Right oh, yeah. So, so in TAC, it's the fairly tactical sector ETF. So we are equal weight different sectors and we right now have full sector exposure. So what we do, we have, think about it as eight equal weighted buckets of about 12 and a half percent. And that would be, you know, what a, a strong tape would look like. We'd have eight sectors. So we have those eight sectors right now. Um, the reason we, you know, assign that equal weight is because we want to make sure that we're, we're rewarding those sectors with the best momentum long term and the best relative strength with a sizable position, right? So we're rewarding the likes of energy and utilities and materials, the smaller groups when they're working. We haven't had great breadth on the sector front until really as of late last year. So that sector breadth, and because we were very concentrated, as you know, I don't want to um, talk about breadth in that way because it got so belabored, right? Um, but, you know, throughout most of last year, we just had technology, communication services, and consumer discretionary because it was so concentrated. And now, of course, with the breadth having expanded on the sector front this year, we've been able to expand our, our reach, you know, in different sectors where that will be a detriment to a portfolio is when technology is like the, the one singular leading sector, right? Because tech is such a huge footprint. So what we've been saying to our tech clients is to say, well, you know, you own tech as a core, uh, you know, sort of long-term hedged equity position, you know, it's, you know, not going to, go wrong during drawdowns, it's going to be there to participate and it will outperform in an environment that isn't wholly tech led. But when we do have that tech led environment to supplement, right? And what we found also is that most of our investors and also clients on the research front, they're like highly interested in, you know, Snowflake and Shopify and, you know, anything that you'd find in like the ARK K ETF. So that they're most interested in technology from a bottom up perspective. So we feel like that that's a great strategy to have a core long term equity position. You're not getting the tax implications of rotating, um, you know, among the sector spiders yourself. And then you have uh, these other positions to supplement it in a stronger tape. But as mentioned, JC, I don't think this is a super strong tape right now. I think it has been, but I think it's lost its hold a little bit. Well, you said Katie, Katie, over the, over the last four to six weeks or so, the best performing groups are the groups that are least represented in the major indexes. Like you said, utilities, materials, energy. The worst performing stocks are the ones with the heaviest weightings in those indexes. So. I, I not just this year, but generally speaking, I have a hard time having a conversation about market breadth without talking about sector rotation, right? And yeah, this, absolutely. Isn't this what you isn't this that? It it is. It, so so when we um, like for the ETF, but also just in our work in general, it's like the um, the breadth has now finally carried over to these smaller sectors, as you mentioned. When we do get a consolidation phase or pullback that's meaningful, whether it's coming now or down the road. What we usually see is the oversold relative sectors do better. They're often the more defensive sectors of the market, right? But it's like you get that kind of, you know, the names that are appear overextended get penalized. And that would be the likes of SMCI and NVIDIA and what have you. Those will be subject to profit taking. And the ones that will be relatively insulated, of course, will be the ones that are relatively oversold. And we've actually started to already see that type of thing from a short term relative perspective. If you look at materials for one or healthcare, you know, you see a little bit, you know, I say improvement in relative performance. But overall, because we have these eight sectors and, and the exposure is there, what that means is that the long term trend following gauges are positive. So 
putting the relatives and the rotation aside, we finally have an environment that's broad based enough. And by the way, you see it in the small cap benchmarks, you see it in, uh, you know, anything equal weighted, right? So you see that spreading out and it's carried over to the long term gauges. So like the monthly MACDs, mostly positive, right? And that wasn't the case for much of last year. So we have metrics like that, that really look very good. Why don't we talk a little bit about um, the Russell 2000? Because we were just mentioning earlier that, you know, not only have we been seeing uh, fewer and fewer stocks in the Russell 2000 making new highs, almost almost none. So now, last week, now you started to see an expansion in new lows, new three-month lows. But this is a great chart because this is a nice reminder, which I try to do quite often, is zoom out on this Russell 2000 chart and show that uh, stair step higher. You know, this this short term breath deterioration in in small caps and everything like that comes within the context of a monster uh, uptrend in the Russell 2000. You want to speak to that a little? Yeah, I mean, listen, that that monthly cloud model that you see that the shaded area on the chart, it's stair stepping higher, like you said. And, and I think that's a great reminder that we're still technically in a secular bull trend. So even though we've lived through a bear market cycle and arguably even last year for the Russell was still that, you know, basing phase, um, that we've come out of it and we've come out of it with a successful test of support, whether you're using the cloud or previous lows. And we also have a base breakout, right? So a base breakout and that breakout is associated with up moves in both the stochastics that you see there and also the MACD has a buy signal after having been on a sell signal for years. So we're in this good place from a, a longer term perspective per the indicators. But as you mentioned, we we have seen and we, we cited this this morning in our morning note in IWM, we, we certainly have a loss of short term momentum that we think will stay with it for, I, I don't know, probably a few weeks or so based on what we're seeing at least at this time. And I think that because it, it's, it's sort of on the back of this big breakout, that the pullback, if it is a pullback, will be welcomed by buyers because they want to they maybe miss the breakout and will welcome the opportunity to add exposure into a pullback or into some weakness and, and feel like they're not chasing some of the, the names that do look overstretched. But here is exactly what we're talking about, that expansion in breath carrying over to more than just the mega cap heavy, you know, benchmarks and ETFs. Katie, do you, do you, we were talking about earlier, do you think, um, you know, the, the weakness that we've seen in small caps, particularly relative to large caps, you think that has to do with the bond market continuing to crash, been falling all year, been falling for four years, like, you know, where, when, when does this bond market crash end? I mean, listen, you and I, you talk about how you've been around for 30 years. I've been around for 20 something years. When you, when you put things in the context of, of markets that have been trading for a long, long time, we're very young, right? Yeah. You and I, we, we look great. <laughs> we, we've lived through, around. well, at least I've lived through a few cycles. Um, so, so with the, you know, sort of cycle that we have underway in treasury yields, we've seen a secular shift and that's something that happens you know, once every decade or a few decades, right? This is something, maybe it's the only one we'll see um, from here to the end of our careers, right? Because, you know, it's a major shift from this downtrend channel that had, had characterized yields. So we do respect that shift, um, but, you know, after years now within that context of upside and yields, we feel like this is a year and maybe even part of next year is a corrective year for yields. So we think that we will actually see better action from treasuries um, and maybe not outperformance versus equities, right? Um, especially in, with the breakouts that we have as of Q4. Uh, but the yields do look poised for consolidation. Um, so we're looking for kind of like sideways to lower for much of this year, if not um, next year. And that comes in part from the long-term trend falling gauges like that monthly MACD indicator. You'll see that it has rolled over for the 10-year treasury yields. That, that's just one example of that sort of meaningful shift that supports corrective action. So while we think we'll have a better market for treasuries, um, you know, it, it probably is only temporary. Um, as much as the trend matters for yields, of course, the level matters, right? If, if we were to, um, you know, sort of project based on where there's support, perhaps, you know, the, the mid threes certainly seems realistic to us as, as a, you know, corrective move, if not slightly lower than that. Um, but I think we can trust that with this secular shift that we've seen, 
that that should give way to a higher low and that that we're into a series of higher highs, higher lows. Katie, I'm, cur I'm curious on this. What makes you think that yields are going to go lower as they make new four month highs this morning? You know, the, the, so for us, that relief rally in, re, in yields is just that. It's a relief rally. And we think it can go to about 455. I'm not sure where they are this morning. Um, that's based on five ish. Yeah. Yeah. So based on a Fibonacci retracement, that would be a 61.8% retracement of the downdraft that preceded this relief rally in yield. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking more long term when I talk corrective action. The short term action we, we've been calling for upside in yields, but something that should mature pretty quickly within even a couple of weeks, potentially. And then yield, of course, uh, yield a lower high versus the 5% threshold, which, of course, was late last year. And are you in the camp that as far as, you know, for, for a lot of investors, uh, especially listening out there, they might not necessarily care about the U.S. 10-year yield. They might necessarily be in the bond market. They're like, I trade mm -hmm. stocks, JC. You know, are you in the camp that it doesn't matter so much to the stock market whether yields are going up or down as long as they're doing so slowly? Right. I, I definitely, not, yeah, right? there's something to that. I can't say it, I, I've done like a scientific study on that, but I definitely sense that, you know, when there's an acceleration or a parabolic move in yields, well, that affects sentiment around equities in a very meaningful way. Whereas if you're getting a bit of a grind, um, you know, it's absorbed by, I'd say, the equity market a little bit better. I think we're actually already kind of seeing that this year, year to date, where the equity market does not seem as closely attuned to yields as it pertains to market sentiment. We've actually had a kind of a wacky year uh, for market sentiment. Um, I don't know if you look at the fear and greed index. That's that's one metric. And it what we the like fear and greed index. What I don't like about the fear and greed index is that half the half, half the data points in the fear and greed index are trend following like their breath. Like so it's hard for yeah, me to look at Half of those element, things from yeah. a contrarian perspective. Like uh, what I think, it, you know, it's spread out amongst, I think, seven different metrics. What I like about it is that it is transactional. So it's actually measuring what's happening in the market, not um, what people are saying. Right. It's not like, how do you feel? You know, which are the investor polls? We look at those two and we kind of take them collectively for a takeaway. Um, but, you know, we feel that that the extremes are worth paying attention to. Right. We're not ever making a call off of sentiment, but we, we let it sort of guide us from almost like a backdrop perspective. Right. If, if sentiment is above that overbought threshold per the fear and greed, maybe per the AAII data. Yeah. And um, that creates a more high risk sort of um, backdrop for the market. And then we also, of course, reference the VIX, which is one component but, but of the Katie, fear and greed index. Katie, would you agree that it's definitely a lot more informative and insightful and maybe even actionable at oversold conditions, at extreme pessimism? Well, definitely over history, of course, because we've had more often than not a bear market, in, or I'm sorry, a bull market cycle in place, right? So the oversold readings... Uh, well, like, you know, over market history, then that goes for price, it goes for breath, it goes for sentiment, those will always be more timely, uh, just because the market more often than not is actually in a secular bull trend. Good point. Good point. Um, but, you know, listen, that the overbought reading here, it just creates, you know, some risk, right? It creates a backdrop. We, we acknowledge that. And then we, of course, go then to the momentum gauges to help us with market timing. So we're not actually using that sentiment reading to say, okay, get hedged. You know, we're actually using that in conjunction with the momentum gauges because that's telling us what's actually happening. So we definitely give more weight to things like the MACDs, to things like the, uh, you know, moving averages where we have an environment that has so many uh, like parabolic or very steep uptrends. And so we put a lot of weight on the 20 day moving average. This is something that may be off our right radar, the different type of, or in a different type of environment. But when the 20 days start to roll over, well, that's usually like a good enough indication of a loss of momentum. Very simple thing to track, of course, that that either you can you know reduce partial exposure, uh, you know, however you choose to do that, hedging or just just selling some you know partial positions. And then once you see any kind of breakdowns, well, then that's a bigger deal. But we do feel like those 20 day moving averages can be really helpful in this environment for, um, you know, to help you manage risk when risk is elevated from a sentiment perspective. And I, I really think it's it's more about NVIDIA than it is about yields right now. I mean, if, uh, you know, if NVIDIA stops going up, God forbid, right, then um, that I think will actually impact sentiment in a pretty meaningful way.
It's in- interesting you mentioned the 20-day moving average. I've heard 21-day moving average, whatever. It's basically about a month. And I, it's, it's, it's clear that you speak to a lot of portfolio managers because if there's any portfolio, anything that portfolio managers that I've noticed a lot from is exactly that. 20-day yeah. moving average, 21-day moving average. They're looking at that as support. So it's really interesting that you, met, that you mentioned that. You brought a couple of charts. Um, Spencer, if you want to throw up, uh, she's got two S&P charts. I'd love to take a quick look at them. Uh, you want to start with the monthly, start bigger picture, and then work our way down? Right, Katie? That's how that's Yeah, how that's, roll, that's right? how I think too, JC. <laughs> 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 we always start with the monthlies. That guides us. And um, then we kind of drill down to the dailies. Um, so, so you see here the same metrics that you had on the Russell 2000 index chart. Um, but importantly, this shows the massive breakout that we've seen for the S&P 500. So it's not a base breakout per se, per se almost more like a cup and handle formation. But look at that momentum. It's it's not only positive, but growing an overbought condition is healthy with that kind of momentum. And so what we do to understand what upside, uh, you know, there may be for the market is we use a measured move projection as something to, you know, when there's no resistance left on a chart. Right. And it projects about 6118 for the S&P 500. So um, that, that's the good news that I bring. Um, and it's listen, it's very long term. It's probably not relevant for this year and maybe for next year. Uh, but it does suggest that this bull market cycle is something that could have some staying power. So, so that's our bullish framework, right? Notice also how the cloud sort of flattened out during the bear cycle, but it never really uh, rolled over. And now it's sort of resumed higher. So we were encouraged by that as just a visual indication of something to come in terms of trend. So, so we're really very bullish long term. And that's why we want to make sure to, you know, just manage risk over the short term, but otherwise, you know, stick with our core long term exposure and just always have attention to uh, risk management through limiting the drawdowns. And that can be done via like a stop loss discipline, through sector rotation, through asset allocation. There's a lot of ways to manage through that, but but we feel pretty comfortable with the market here. And I like how you said that because different different people, different PMs, different investors of different ages and different objectives are gonna do different things based on this data, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like, oh, the MACD and the ich- Ichiro cloud and the this, so sell everything. No, it, do- it doesn't work that way, right? Like, you know, some are long short, some are long only, you know, yeah, some are longer a, term, some are it's shorter definitely, term. Yeah, I mean, it, not one, you know, especially in our business where we're providing advice to a, a wide audience, it, you know, it's not one size fits all in terms of the takeaway. Uh, but what we can do is, is, talk about where there's support as a gauge of risk, perhaps, and, um, you know, understand at least when risk is more elevated and that that can add some value. But but to always keep these long term trends on your side and your positioning. So as much as I think people do get us included, get caught up in the short term action. Right. You know, we're all hyper focused on things like the VIX. But um, in reality, uh, you know, this trend is something that we wouldn't want to fight, right? So so we're not out there recommending all sorts of short positions. Uh, you know, we're really on board with the uptrend because the indicators tell us to be on board with it. And when they change, we'll change with it. So it, that could happen close to 6,100. It could happen well below. So we don't really know. It's not, we don't have that crystal ball, but we can put- you don't? You know, no, unfortunately. <laughs> I Hold think on, Katie. I- in your in your experience, I mean, monthly charts are just so near and dear to my heart. Anybody who knows me knows that. Obviously, they are to you as well. Maybe it's because we were trained in similar ways. I don't know. But why do you think these monthly charts are so underappreciated? They're so right. Because they're like- boring, JC. They're they're not. They don't move fast enough for people. And that's you know that's. So, and our ETF is a very slow moving ship too. But isn't that inherent. why you and I like them? Because of that? I, well, maybe. And I mean, listen, there, there can be excitement in the market in different ways, right? You still should have those monthlies on your side and your positioning. What What is exciting right now is that the monthlies have turned for the small caps and other things, right? So we have just more more to do, I would say, that more to get excited about longer term. And that gives us the ability to say, okay, well, um, now I'm going to go into, 
you know, the, the cloud computing space and look for base breakouts, right? So, so you can let it create a backdrop for you and, and you know, allow for you to then take advantage of higher beta positioning. Um, I mean, we, we can't, we have to also talk about Bitcoin here, right? Because I, I know that your audience was um, sort of against that perhaps, but, um, you know, with, with that, it, the uptrend, I mean, listen, we had a, a major base breakout and, you um, you know, the momentum has been there and it's also been a real reflection of market sentiment, right? So talk about high beta. Um, so if you need something high beta, there's always something to take advantage of, but the sentiment there, um, you know, think of it as like a risk on metric, right? And and arguably Bitcoin should probably digest in here right after, after um, its breakout to new all time highs. I think some digestion would be pretty natural. Um, but listen, it, it's a great read on market sentiment as well. Katie, I, I swear I never thought that you and I would be having this conversation about the mar bond market and the stock market. And while gold is breaking out of a major base and new all time highs, you mentioned Bitcoin first. Didn't yeah. see that one coming, Katie. Well, no, I'm trying to keep it exciting. That's what. <laughs> but Katie, can you tell the kids, remember in the aughts, you know, this was early in my career, relatively early in your career, too. Um, it was cool being a gold bug. All my yeah, heroes yeah. were gold bugs. <laughs> like everybody, Alan Shaw, Luis Yamada, like John Rogue, like all my favorite well, maybe technicians. Maybe it'll become all... cool again with the breakout because I mean, it, it is a major breakout. We're talking, and we've been, we've actually been bored ourselves waiting for the breakout, right? Because we've been talking about it ad nauseum for what it feels like years. Um, and, and we always wait in our discipline, we always wait for breakouts to be confirmed. So we want to make sure we get a couple of good solid weekly closes above a long-term level, like the 2063 for gold. And I mean, it, it hit it a couple of times, more than a couple of times even, yeah. even and didn't get that second close until very recently. So, so it is kind of exciting for gold. Gold it, itself maybe isn't the most exciting asset class, but um, you know, we see real potential for gold to be in this kind of secular bull trend and silver is maybe playing catch up to that. Um, so we think that that just gives us more assets to choose from and um, we welcome that for sure. It's about time, huh? Yeah, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> Katie, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Katie Stockton, check out the ETF. It's uh, T-A-C-K, right? You got it, JC. Yep, thanks so much. It's really good to see you guys, and good luck. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Cheers. Cheers. Katie Stockton in the house. What'd you think, Straza? It's hard doing interviews with you sometimes. You Why do excited. I steal all the questions of, of the best guests? You get excited. You don't, there's, there's like, um, yeah, like no, no, no pause. I can't jump in. I want to ask about the Ichimokus. No, I get nothing. All right. I know. I apologize all the time. Strazzy says I steal all the questions. I should have just took a 15 minute break. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not sorry. You know, <laughs> no, you're not. It's okay. No, it's okay. Listen, she always, um, I've been watching Katie do this thing for, I don't remember not watching Katie do this thing, you know, like she's always, she's always been like, you know, part of like the technical community as you know, longer than I have. Um, so, I mean, yeah, she's always been a huge inspiration. You know, she's a little more indicator heavy than I am, you know, which is fine. But even, um, yeah, I get it. But even the indicators, I mean, she's using monthly MACD crossovers. I mean, it couldn't be simpler. Right. Yeah. So I think there's still that theme of simplicity. A lot of our favorite guests or favorite technicians, they come on and they say the simplest shit. And it's 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 great, right? And I Katie's one it's of also a good it's also a great example. Katie and I were literally trained the exact same way from a similar generation of technicians who read kind of the same books, right? Different generations of technicians kind of read different books over the years. Um, and you know, we have a we do a lot of the things the same, and and she does things that are very different. Like there's no does it make it better or worse or bad or good? Like she likes the fear greed index. I do not. You know, she uses the Ichiro clouds. I do not. You now know, I she's ask how she's using them though. Like I think I like is the Ichimoku like a stop or like that monthly MACD in last fall was like this close to crossing. So would that have flipped the model bearish or then is it the Ichimokus? Almost crossing when what? S and P's? No, the monthly MACD, if you, if you throw the in chart. In what? <coughs> S&P. 
Oh, that's what I'm saying. That's a piece. Um, JC is an excitable boy. Yes, yeah, stock market Mike. Shout out Warren Zevon. Listen, you got me and Katie Stockton talking charts. I mean, let's go. I mean, we haven't, I haven't seen Katie non, you know, she was at our dinner the other night and then she came to the birthday party. I mean, I haven't seen Katie socially um, and, you know, not talking market. So this is fantastic. Yeah, I get excited. So. No, no, it was good. So to not be excited. I mean, you know, I like it when you're excited. We get great guests. It's not my fault. We have such good guests. <laughs> Uh, Maybe it is. Um, all right, uh, Spencer. Uh, it's uh, Monday. Uh, anything? Anything we need to know, or not really? We got some news to go over. There, all right, what do we got? Yeah, we got we got a few things. Um, I mentioned this last week, and I'm, I'm going to mention it again today. Uh, Nvidia. Okay, they've got their big. Uh, what is it? The GTC AI conference. It starts today. It goes through Wednesday. This is when they unveil their next generation of AI chips. Um, so this is their uh, conference, their company wide conference. Yes, this is like Nvidia's version yeah. of like Salesforce Dreamforce, if you know what that yeah. is. But um, yeah. yeah, so they're gonna it's gonna be all Nvidia hype the next three days. Uh last year during this conference, the stock ended ended up closing, I think, three percent higher over the course of the three days. Um, 3%. So Ooh. That, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know you're going to say, but still, it's not nothing. Uh, there's going to be a lot of headlines. Uh, there's a keynote address by Jensen Wong today. So just keep this uh, as if NVIDIA is not already on your radar, but uh, keep the conference in the back of your mind as you um, as you watch this thing because there will be news here. Uh, so you're NVIDIA saying headline. CNBC got it right. I just got a breaking news alert that uh, NVIDIA is fueling the AI hyped rally here this morning. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, they are. They are the AI hyped rally. Okay. Uh, elsewhere, uh, report f report from Bloomberg that uh, uh, Apple is in talks with Google to license uh, the Gemini AI, um, I guess, software uh, for the iPhone. So Apple may be paying Google for Google's AI. Um, Apple has been noticeably noticeably quiet on the ai front these past uh yeah what 10 Both. 11 12 months so okay we talked about this recently what, what did we say we talked about this do you remember we said we they'd be coming Google. oh oh or apple we said apple would be coming with some both of, them. Both of yeah. these companies have been kind of marred with the left out of the ai hype yeah. right Google, yeah, yep. you really want to make the bet, Google and Apple, they're just going to you know, miss out on this AI thing? It's crazy. The dip buying opportunity in Google two weeks ago was ridiculous. You didn't get in. I don't know what you're doing. This is a bull market. Google's down whatever it was, 10, 15, 20%. Hit for no reason because yeah. what, what's the team and I. And now look, that's going to, the narrative will change. They're going to be just fine. They're going to be one of the companies that benefits the most from AI, period. Yep. Uh, I'd be shocked if yep. you look back on that's not the obvious outcome. And guess what? Apple is too. Apple's going to absolutely dominate this whole AI thing. Your iPhone is about to be like 10 times cooler than you could ever have imagined. That's it. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, okay, moving away from the mega caps. Uh, I saw this. This caught my eye this morning. EH, Ehang Holdings. They what began selling. They began the stocks up, what, like 20% today? They began selling th their their flying taxis in Sh over in China Stop. for the the equivalent of three hundred and thirty two thousand dollars a pop. You want a flying taxi? Go to that's it. That you said three hundred thirty thousand. That's what it, that's what Reuters says. Is this like Jetson stuff? Have you seen a video? I got to go watch a video. I have seen pictures. I have not seen a video. What do they look like? I mean, they look like flying to I don't know. They look like um like they're like large drones. I think this yeah. is yeah. There's something going on here. We, we talked all about Archer Aviation uh, last week. We we know about the Joby. Um, this is a really cool thing. I'm so excited for this. And apparently, it's going to be like cheaper and require less fuel. I right. ESG. Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, um, what's Steve? What's going on with with, uh, with Micron here? Because you put a few things in in the doc about 
Micron today, but Micron had a bunch of analyst commentary last week as well. There was like five or six different notes out on Micron. Do they? Was there a thing? So, Did they? I didn't see earnings, so I don't. I don't, report, I don't know. They report on Wednesday. Um, oh, that's interesting. So this is, uh, yeah, this is really interesting, right? So this is typically you see what Spencer's saying is there's just been like um, uh, the, the 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 analyst price hikes are just pouring in. Typically, oh, yeah. you see that right yeah. after a report, but they're all trying to front run this one. And what do we get? Like four different hikes today. And one, like you said, last week, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven price hikes in the last two days. This what's a, this is what's obnoxious about the sell side. Like maybe one of the big analyst moves, then another two move, and then they all just move together because no one wants to be left. So this is what you see. So like 10 price hikes since last week ahead of earnings for Micron. I don't know. The street seems pretty excited. As a technician, this chart really excites me. We talk about these structural bases and how they can take time, blah, 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 and you need a catalyst. You know, maybe this earnings report coming up in a few days is that catalyst blasts us through 100. Uh, and then this one's going to look like all the other massive semiconductor.com bubble base breakouts. And the sky's the limit. So blue skies and all-time highs right around the corner for Micron. And Wall Street likes it. Also, everyone in the chat, I have a new mic, and I'm going to replace it. I, I got it over the weekend. I'm replacing my mic today. So you, I'll have a new mic for you guys tomorrow. Um, what else is in the doc? There was a meta, some of a meta in there that I saw very briefly that you dropped in there. What is it? Oh, just another top pick. Yeah, top pick, schmop pick. Uh, I don't know. Dude, these top uh, picks are, are terrible. Another one, I don't know. I think it was yeah, Morgan Stanley. You see the Morgan Stanley one today? Top uh, pick, no. Pepsi. I try, I try not. Dude. It's Morgan Stanley. How many bull markets has Morgan Stanley seen? They're going to come out and tell you Pepsi is the best pick for this bull market? JC, is there anything wrong with that? That's that's bullshit. That's just awful. That's really bad. Well, first of all, is it a surprise that sell side research is bullshit? Number one. Number come two, on. I like how they kicked their perma bear off their uh, research board. That's pretty funny. Right. And also, and the last yeah. thing is, is that... Um, I mean, it is hilarious that they kicked their promo bear out of the uh, out of the research uh, the board. But also, um, imagine how hard it must be to be a financial advisor during a bull market, telling your customers how great the research is in Morgan Stanley, which is why you should have an account there. Oh. And then you know, you, the research is telling you to avoid the whole bull market. Like that's got to be tough living. Which, by the way, which is probably why you're seeing so many advisors leaving Morgan Stanley with all their assets. I don't want to mention any names, but a good friend of ours left Morgan Stanley with $350 million in assets, 100% of the AUM, and has since then tripled that uh, or almost quadrupled to $1.2 billion in assets. Uh, took it all from Morgan Stanley. Good for them. I don't need to mention any names, but. Pouring salt in the wound over here. Who? I don't know. Me? Me? Yeah. I mean, listen, it's been a tough bull market for Morgan Stanley. Yeah. I don't give a shit about Morgan Stanley. I didn't say you did. Oh, I'm just I'm just spitting facts here, baby. I got I got I don't have a horse in the race. I hope Morgan Stanley does great. I got no beef with them at all. I'm just just dropping facts. No big deal. And I guess so. My problem with it is this. I, I get it. The sell side stuff is just the support service at this point for these big sell side banks. Don't give me Pepsi as your top pick, because not only is that lazy and terrible, but I think it's misleading and, and downright dishonest. I think that's that's total shit because we have the data and anybody. But what chat, if they really like Pepsi? Like of all the things you could hate on Morgan Stanley for, that's what you're hating on, that they like Pepsi? Any junior analyst knows Pepsi is not a conviction buy in a bull market. It is going to underperform. It does every single time we have that data. So either you're making a bear market call by picking Pepsi right, as your top pick, or you, you just suck and you don't care, right? Maybe because they just like maybe they just like the fundamentals. Listen, <laughs> right, right, okay. Meta was another pick. What was also it? betting on Americans getting fatter is not the worst trade. Potato chips and sodas. I mean, Dude. that's my fundamental analysis on Pepsi. No, stop. It's that they picked a mega cap staples company as their bull market conviction pick. That's a, so they that's, only hold on. So how does this work? They only pick one stock. Uh, no, they typically no, have no. Every, no. They all do it differently, right? No, so then why are we why are we cherry picking Pepsi of all of their picks? That's the one they just came out with. Oh, maybe uh, they like anyway. Pepsi. 
you, yeah, whatever. But I get what you're saying, Strasza. I get what you're saying. Meta was another whatever top pick that came out today. Still kind of lazy, kind of an easy one, but m- fine, fine. I won't bitch about that one, right? At least you're going growth, you're going tech, you're going AI. Put yourself out there a little bit. Pick one that nobody's ever heard of, right? Pick a mid cap. Go crazy. Pick pick a building materials name. But Meta and Pepsi, cool, sweet. Thanks so much. Really need that research on my desk. But they're not they're not in the business of providing good research. They're in the business of increasing shareholder value. Right. And, and, and if they believe that throwing out Pepsi is going to do that, then good for them. They're not I in the business it. of helping people. They're in the business of making money for shareholders, or at least get all to. that. But pretend a little bit. Try for me. Listen, everybody knows they don't give a shit about their customers or anybody else, nor should they. Their job, they should care about their shareholders. That's what matters. And they're making decisions for that, whether it works or whether it doesn't. I mean, listen, uh, Morgan Stanley stocks at the same level was 25 years ago. So, you know. I told you. I told you buy that dip in Google. You're going to run it right back through those prior highs happening right here today. Up over 7%. Google is a monster. Don't yeah. bet against these companies. They will rip your faces off. It's crazy. Well, first of all, I didn't bet against no, I know uh, you're not. Google. I know you did. I know somebody in the chat shortened Google today. Listen, I got Apple puts. Apple's up 2% today. You know, granted, the market just opened. We'll see what happens. You know, that's the same same thing. Dangerous, man. Dangerous. And it's hooking higher above a, of a key level, it looks like, pretty soon here. Well, maybe, we'll, maybe, maybe we'll flip the trade and go long. I'm, I've, I've been known to do so in the past. Don't bet against big tech. Very dangerous. You, you guys want to talk commodities? Please. Or rates or, bo- yeah. or both? I'm not sure yes, what you please. want to do a few things. I want Cully. All right. Ian Cully. Yeah. You, you want Cully? Is that I what you said? Cully. I want Cully. 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 What's happening, hey. guys? Ian Cully. What's happening, my man? I tell you, those sell side analysts, JC. Can't, can't, can't trust them, man. It's tough living. It's tough living. You know, you're looking more and more like a monk these days, you know? You know, it's easy. I got three kids now. Not you a whole know? lot of time. You look like one of these myself. Heidi Krishna guys. Like, if you dress like in, the, like in those yellow gowns and, like, hand out, like, little cards on the street, you could be a Heidi Krishna. <laughs> I heard they got good awesome. food. They got good food, though. Yeah? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I've ever eaten uh, yeah. with them. Yeah. Um, okay. They're friendly, though. I feel bad. Like when I'm in the city, like I'm on the phone and I'm running from meeting to meeting and they're trying to talk to me. It's like barking up the wrong tree, buddy. <laughs> you know? Um, so Ian Cully. Mm-hmm. The big question to me is, um, is the bond market crash over? I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that last year was the capitulation. I'm seeing bonds falling all year long. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a big deal. I, I have not seen enough evidence to suggest that this bottom market crash is over. And that's really, um, you know, what's, what's, what's in my head. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, 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 the underlying trend for rates remains higher and for bonds lower. It's, it's really that simple. Um, we had a great trade. You know, we yeah. had a tactical long. It worked. It hit our target. And it's, you know, it's rolled over. It's been trending lower since. So. You know, it, there's no, there's no sense in stepping in and, and trying to buy bonds. Are you, are you surprised at just how well that bond trade worked off support in TLT, the TLT ETF, right? Like we went, got back down to those lows from 20 years ago and it literally kissed it and bounced from there. Yeah. It's just, you know, a, it's just, it's just like a pretty coincidence or do you think there was something there? Yeah, there's definitely something there. Um, I'll admit, I really didn't like putting, uh, putting that trade on. I, d- I didn't want to buy bonds down there. And for, you know, for the reasons that we're discussing now, I mean, bonds are still a short from a structural perspective, but it was a great example of, you know, tra- you can trade against the trend yeah. with some success. Um, just, just know that that's what you're doing. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Hold, uh, on, be. Hold on. This is your moment, Ian. Yes. See? Large cap material sector spider, mm-hmm. new all time highs at least on a weekly basis. We're talking about copper making big moves. You've been talking about precious metals. Energy has had our attention for about a month now. Keeps working. 
this is this is the world you like to operate in no it's all bull market commodity stuff yeah i mean we're talking about expressing a bullish thesis um on commodities through the equity market the best way to do that is through the material space through the metal and mining stocks through right. the through energy stocks and when we look at cocoa and you see cocoa ripping uh you see sugar ripping or oj that's a little more difficult to gain exposure to uh when you're trading equities uh so yes yeah, seeing you know xlb break out on an absolute basis seeing it start to to hook higher relative to to the broader market xlb yes. relative to spy uh, is another great chart um yeah it, it speaks to to copper's recent breakout it speaks to gold's breakout um you know crude oil trading back above 81 you know commodities are are starting to starting to work i mean jc pointed out over the weekend you know it's it's the that the the, the pain that that most investors you know probably aren't ready for or aren't positioned for is that commodities starting to outperform stocks mm -hmm. um, and, I, and i love how i love i really love how difficult it is for yeah. everyday investors to get exposure to commodities right um i think to me that that's like an in, like a built-in short squeeze it's kind of like you know straza how like when we talk about like companies like palantir or disney which by the way is making new 52 week highs one for the good guys um these are companies that for some reason people hate and maybe they hate like the guy or they hate that they're too woke or whatever it is for whatever reason they don't want to buy the stock so there's kind of like this built-in short squeeze i feel like commodities have that it's not that people hate commodities i guess some people do it's just you can't even buy it it's it, it's yeah. built in negative sentiment Did, yeah. they delisted all of these equity market vehicles what 22 in just a few years ago right yeah. a whole yeah. slew of commodity tf out not that they were liquid or good vehicles anyways yeah they were yeah it's all we had for some yeah. things it's yeah. just poof gone what about that invesco one it ain't bad um is it was it dba dba is it right is it dba yeah i think it's dba b dbc dbp yeah look at dba no dba is the agriculture fund that's not it it's that's db dbc it's mm. dbc yeah, that's it. DBC. So DBC is the Invesco uh, Commodity Index Tracking Fund. And I'll just give you a quick little rundown. You got a lot of energy, right? So you got 12.5% gas, 12.5% Brent crude, 12.5% uh, West Texas crude, New York Harbor, ULSD, 12%. So you're looking at almost half is just energy. Then you got 8% gold. You only got 2% silver. 4% copper, 4% zinc. Uh, then you got your wheat at uh, 5%, corn 5%, beans 5%. Then you got your sugar, right? So that's the breakdown. It's not perfect. It's a little too much energy, but that's probably as good as you're going to get, right? DBC, how much in assets do they have? 1.6 billion. It's not nothing. Trades a million shares a day. So there's liquidity there. That's as good as it's going to get. Yeah, if you, if you want to buy an index. You want to buy an ETF, yeah, yeah. Right, if you, a, yeah. A, a, exactly, like, a basket of all of them, right? Yeah, right. if you want to buy a basket of all of them, or you can go out and buy individual companies that are showing relative strength in the energy space, uh, in the metal and mining space. I think I, that's the route I would rather take. I mean, you mentioned that what DBC's got, what, 5% grains. You got some, some wheat and some beans in there, maybe a little corn. I don't want any of that right now. <laughs> I mean, look at those charts. That's not... I don't, I, no way you're not, you're not getting much of it anyway so you don't need to worry well, about that i want zero oh. <laughs> so um yeah i i'd rather i'd rather trade individual companies when it comes to uh jonathan to makes it. a good point in the chat yeah. nib is one of those uh i believe it's actually etn exchange traded no is nib still no. around no no it was delisted right yeah. before the coco <laughs> ripper i mean Right before Coco ripped? Yes. But I'm amazed. Talk to me. I know you brought some Palladium stuff. I know you want to talk about Palladium. How is this thing not delisted yet? This is not. Can you buy this? This is Which liquid one? enough? GSG? No, the PAL. Oh, no. That's uh, Aberdeen. That uh, No, that's, I don't think this is going anywhere. I don't think some of these, uh, these physical uh, metal ETFs are going anywhere. They, I mean, they're probably 
uh, coming out with new ones. I was you took the words yeah. right out of my mouth. Yeah, Ian. there's probably new ones coming out. Some zinc, aluminum, lead, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just because exactly. these these things are starting to work, or why would they come? Yeah, I mean they're starting to work. Absolutely. Um, Palladium is one of my favorites. You been watching this 85, 86 level uh, for a while now. Uh, towards the end of last year, wanted to trade against it. You know, price came back down, uh, undercut that level uh, earlier this year, and is now bouncing higher. Completed you know, a, a short duration, like eight week uh, inverted head and shoulders um, recently, and uh, is starting to rip. So gold broke out, copper followed, crude oil starting to go. I think it's just a matter of time before palladium, yeah. platinum, you know, uh, join. Uh, in the rally and, and we're looking at silver silver starting to outperform gold which is yep. extremely healthy for risk appetite for the precious metal space i think once silver takes out that 26 26 50 level <clears throat> things really start to get interesting yeah you know not a ton of outperformance but moving in the right direction and, and the miners starting to work it, mm -hmm. it seems to be coming together is this pall though this is a this is an okay vehicle this is liquid enough to to get long or no i i mean depends on who you are depends yeah on who you are. it depends on who you are and how much you're moving um i think it, it, it's a good vehicle if you can't go out and buy uh palladium futures and you want a pure play all right ian is and, palladium uh is that a base metal or a precious metal depends on who you ask haha uh -huh. depends on I'm who you ask answer. um you know what do you uh, think ask, I'm asking ask you, a jeweler bro. and they'll say they'll say precious ask you know Anyone else, her. I would imagine they'd say industrial. <laughs> hold on. So hold on. So if you ask a jeweler, you think they'll say precious metals. If you ask an investor or a normie, they'll say it's a base metal. Can you yeah, explain it just, your thought it looks, process there? Yeah, I mean, it palladium tends to trade with with risk assets. It tends to trade with tech, which I, I think is is really interesting. Um, I was going back and I, I can't remember how I stumbled upon it, but in the archives, uh, the All Star Charts archives, I uh, ran into an article from over a decade ago. Ooh. You're highlighting the, this correlation between tech and palladium um, from from some Bartoloni charts. That's awesome. Yeah, that it's awesome. really really cool. Um, Someone uh, has too much time on their hands. Yeah, I, I never would imagine. <laughs> oh, you or Ian? <laughs> yeah, well, both of us probably, yeah. but you know. <laughs> That's funny, Ian. Uh, yeah, I just cool. wanna, Very cool. uh, so thrusty last week was thrusty for copper. And I don't know if there's a single contract in the commodities world that I would rather see momentum thrust from, uh, to make me feel like it's a bull market than copper. I think that's, that's stands alone. So the biggest single day move since I believe November of 2022, yeah. the best, uh, weekly performance for Dr. Copper since January of last year. So you got to go back year year and a half for these kinds of moves on both a daily and a weekly time frame i have i have it drawn just like you it's a nice little you know intermediate term reversal pattern it's going to run back up to the upper bounds then it's got to get it done there right once right. it gets four four and a quarter there's another test yeah four yeah four and a quarter um i think that 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 you know, logical area to see some some supply come in some selling pressure and but it's really that five dollar level, you yeah. Know, that's that's what we're looking. We're looking for a decisive close above five bucks. That's kind of like that twenty one hundred level in gold. Uh, in gold, yes. And so, so looking at gold, seeing gold breakout, and I mean that was a solid breakout in gold, and it's holding. We're starting to see participation broaden. So I think you know it's just a matter of time before we see copper above five. Uh, yeah. Um, so. Are you already overlaying copper, zooming out 15 years, overlaying it with gold, right? Yeah. Remember those charts, right? Yeah. Uh, so gold moving first doesn't surprise you. And now copper probably follows that path. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Absolutely. And just the broader commodity space. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And then one more thing I would say is Southern Copper. With that massive breakout that's your oh, man. equity yeah. market leader for this space exploded higher 
last week. You made a great point last week in our meeting, Straza, that Southern Copper has a much larger market cap than Freeport McMoran. Freeport McMoran right around sixty-four billion right now. Southern Copper, eighty billion. You want to see those leaders? They tacked day? on. They tacked on ten billion last week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But Twenty. Really it's twenty-one uh, percent of the Peru ETF. We talk about wow. Freeport a lot. You know, if Freeport's a bellwether, then so is Southern Copper. So Southern Copper. So what that means is that um, uh, Southern Copper. I mean, it's it's twenty. What did I say? Twenty two percent of the Peru ETF, but it's a base in Phoenix. So what? They just have like a lot of exposure down in Peru or something like that. Big employer, maybe. I don't know. I don't That's know. A good question. I don't know. They probably got a mine in Peru. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Who know. doesn't have a mine in Peru? If you don't have a mine in Peru, are you even trying? <laughs> We had a uh, well. We'll talk about it tomorrow. We had a hot corner name today. It's ten oh one. Do we Let's have? Roll. Let's roll. Hit the bumper quick. Oh hey. I just want to give a quick shout out to the Fairfield Stags basketball team. Made it to the MAC championship game. Lost to the. Uh, uh, what are what are they? The uh, the St. Peter's. Uh, St. Peter's. What is Dales? it? Uh, what are they? The, the Cox? Are they the Gamecocks? No. So not the Gales. That's St. Mary's. I don't know. But they had a really good run in the tournament, what, two years ago? They were like the Cinderella team. Listen, that would have been nice if Fairfield made it. They they, And they were winning that game. I was bummed. I was I really – did you watch? Uh, yeah, the, the, the Cox. They're the Peacocks. That's it. The Peacocks. Right, right, right. The, the St. Peter's College Peacocks. <laughs> This was shout out to the Peacocks, yeah. you know, Jersey City, right? Yeah, mm, that's uh, right. I want to hear Spencer's thoughts on 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 last night, though. We, this was an interesting one. I think college football was interesting with the playoff, and the and the committee had a really tough time selecting right and screwing Florida State last year. And I can't think of a year where it's been harder for the NCAA committee to pick the seeding. Uh, there was just a lot of bid. There was a lot of bid thieves. A lot of teams that weren't supposed to win the tournaments did so right and that's unfortunate because it bumps teams like indiana yeah. state i would love to see indiana state in the tournament this year they got bumped it's unfortunate yeah. right? so uh you yeah. know it it, it it that's 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 the way it goes that's, na that's the nature of the beast it sucks if you're on the bubble then don't be on the bubble next year <laughs> that's right win more games damn it <laughs> Win, right. win more games and this isn't an issue but i'm this is probably the my favorite sports week of the year uh really thursday through sunday will be my is my favorite four-day period of the sports calendar and i'm so freaking excited can't wait uh can't yeah wait. so congratulations uconn you guys are all gonna get really sick of me talking about uconn for the next two weeks so just get used to it i'm not sorry so big east uh unless they blow it this weekend we'll see <laughs> That's good. big east uh, by, by the way i Mm -hmm. I uh, I learned something. People were wondering about what happened with BYU. Why why are they lower than they should have been? It's because yeah. I didn't know this. B BYU does not play on Sunday, so the committee had to schedule them in the Thursday Saturday group because BYU will not play basketball. On Sunday. Even I did not know that. Wow, not that is, I, no, I went I to a, I went to a bowl game once. It was Memphis against BYU, and I sat in the BYU section. No, and geez, the concessions, like all the bars mm -hmm. and the beers. There was no lines anywhere. Yeah. You could just walk right up, get a drink, and go sit down. It was it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. All right, so UConn uh, NCAA regular season champions, uh, Big East Conference champions, uh, going for back to back NCAA tournament champions, which is a really big deal. Maybe not such a big deal for UConn because our women do it all the time, but it'd be cool for the men uh, for the men's program to do it as well. And frankly, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like anybody is even close to them. Last year, if you remember through the tournament, we were just blowing teams out by 20, 30 points. I don't want to jinx it, but I think Dan Hurley hit it right on the head in his remarks uh, during the trophy ceremony this weekend. He said, nobody in the country has played as good as these guys this year. It's not even close. Hopefully we can carry that for another couple of weeks through the tournament. So I'm super excited. Let's go Huskies. Uh, drop the link. Mm -hmm. we, got, uh, we got our conference call tonight. Uh, so I gotta go. Uh, I gotta prepare for this thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I was ten oh five. It's late, guys. We're right. We got the flow show coming up in uh, an hour and a half. Uh, come back for that. Ian, thank you. Katie, thank you. Chat, thank you. We'll see you guys later. Go make some money. Happy Adios. Monday. See you guys.